We are here today with Andrew Turner from Colonial Farm Credit and on behalf of Virginia State University's Small Farm Outreach, we would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Absolutely. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Andrew Turner. I work for Colonial Farm Credit and I'm out of our Chesapeake office. So I primarily work um, in Ches the cities of Chesapeake and Virginia Beach. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about presenting your business to a lender. Uh, feel free to ask as many questions um, at any time and I'll stop and address them as they come up. The more questions you ask, the more things I can answer from an experience standpoint and kind of, you know, we can have more of an engaging conversation that way. So I will be running through a slide deck um, and I can get this over to you guys um, to have a copy of after the presentation. So to get started, um, we'll start with a disclaimer. First and foremost, we are not um, lawyers, tax accountants, and we are not giving any legal or accounting advice. This is simply um, recommendations that are derived out of the financial guidelines for agriculture producers. Um, that comes from the Farm Financial Standards Council. So, um, like I said, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not giving any of that advice. It's more so just some recommendations and some things that we see and that may be able to help you all. So the first thing is, for starters, is really understanding what a lender's job is. Um, the first thing here is really every lender is in the business of assessing risk and determining the ability of a customer to repay their obligations. In my opinion, this is really the one thing that kind of brings all lenders together, right? Whether it's a residential lender that specializes in doing homes, condos, townhomes, or an agriculture lender that specializes in lending for uh, farm improvements, farmland, equipment, things like that. This is the one thing that's going to kind of bridge um, all lenders together. Every lender is in, is their job is really to um, assess risk and determine if the customer can repay um, for whatever the, the request is. So, you know, with that being said, every lender is going to use different components to determine the credit worthiness of a customer. Uh, each and every bank kind of has their own style of underwriting. They all kind of look at different, different tool, use different tools and look at different things when it comes to assessing risk level. Um, with that being said, every lender has a different level of risk tolerance. So one thing you may common, commonly hear, um, and, and this kind of goes from agriculture to commercial to residential, whatever type of lending it is, you know, a common ratio you hear, you hear folks talk about is payment to income levels or debt to income levels. Both of those are kind of used interchangeably. Well, you know, let's say you went to BB&T you know, or SunTrust or Wells Fargo, their payment to income level, what they are comfortable extending, you know, money towards may be different than farm credit. So we're both looking at the same ratios, but our lending requirements are different. So that's kind of a quick example of how every lender has a different level of risk um, or, or risk tolerance. So you can have two banks that look at the exact same uh, ratio or do ratio analysis and each of them have a different risk tolerance. So um, that's just one thing to keep in mind, um, you know, as you guys go forward with, you know, potentially meeting with lenders. So when you actually go to meet with a lender, um, first and foremost, be prepared and be confident um, you're there really to sell yourself and your business or whatever your business plan is, whatever you're trying to seek financing on, you need to be, you need to be prepared and be confident. Um, having the necessary information available, I'll touch on kind of each of these things that you guys see 
on the screen now because they each kind of play their own role in, um, you know, playing a part in what the lender is going to be looking for. So the first thing is, is your financial statement. So that's going to be your assets, your liabilities, and then assets minus liabilities is going to equal your net worth. If your business is operating separate from you personally, you may actually have two financial statements. You would have one personally and one for the business. Um, if you're a smaller operation uh, and you're not really, you're, you're personally, you're not really separated from the business or the business is not really separated from you personally, having one financial statement that encompasses everything is okay. As operations get bigger, uh, most of the time we start to see um, those separate into having one financial statement personally and one for the business or even multiple if there's different businesses involved. Um, so when, when you prepare your financial statement, we prefer uh, specifically with farm credit and um, as we work through the financial statement, Generally, your assets are broken into three different categories. You have your current assets, you have your intermediate assets, and you have your long-term assets. Um, when, when you prepare this and go meet with a lender, verifying those current assets is going to, one, show you're prepared for the meeting, and B, it's going gonna, it's gonna to prove to your lender that when you sat down to complete your financial statement, that you did it to the best of your ability um, in making that financial statement accurate. So when we say verification of assets, really what we're looking at is verification of those current assets. And current assets are really anything that can be converted into cash within 12 years. So, or, or excuse me, 12 months. So that would be your, your, your cash accounts, check-ins, savings, CDs. Um, you can even grab retirement um, verification. Verification levels kind of vary depending on the lender. They're sometimes lender specific. If, but if you bring in, um, say, you know, a copy of a recent bank sta statement or a screenshot of how much cash or savings you currently have, something like that, you know, if you put on your financial statement that you have $50,000 in cash or $10,000 in cash, um, and you have that supporting document to say, hey, here's you know, last month's bank statement to show I have the 50,000 in cash. That's awesome. That's, that's, that's really gonna help um, not only A, expedite your underwriting for whatever you're requesting when you meet with your banker, but also it's gonna show that you took the time to prepare and, and you were ready for your, your meeting with the lender. Um, so, kind of switching gears from the financial statement, uh, getting over into your income statement and tax or income statement or tax returns. Um, so your income statement is just gonna be sales, expenses, kind of where, where the money is being spent. Um, tax returns are a source of an income statement. So if you're going to meet with a lender and you have a couple years of tax returns that you can take with you, that is great. Um, so anything that you can take that's going to show your lender, um, A, like I said, that you're prepared um, and you have the, that financial history that the lender is gonna, is gonna um, need and require. If, if you're going to meet with somebody like myself at Farm Credit, you can always call and, um, you know, we'll set up a meeting and I will let you know those items that you need before you come in. Right. So I'll give you a little checklist that would really, you know, some things you can bring when you come meet with me that would um, really help expedite the underwriting process um, and things like that. Another thing you can do is prepare, prepare a budget or your projections. So what are you projecting for this operating season what is your crop schedule going to be? Um, you know, where do you, where are your projections falling in line? Things like, um, things like that. So all of that stuff is really, really going to help um, in the lender preparing a loan decision. So anything you can do to um, help us out as lenders is going, is going, is going to be good. 
if you have a business plan, if this is your first year in operation or even your first few years, take that business plan with you to meet with the lender. Um, it helps the lender understand exactly what you're thinking, kind of how we get from point A to point B. If it's a startup and we're starting at, at, at this point, you know, what is our one year plan, two year plan, five year plan, all of that stuff is, 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 is good. So with that being said, you, as far as preparing and being confident um, in, in yourself, in your business, you need to know information about your business. Like I said, the business plan is important. What's your legal structure gonna be? Um, do you need to meet with an accountant or an attorney to, to help you prepare the, the appropriate legal structure? Um, your financial position and financial ratios will touch on those here in a little bit. Your cost of production, uh, your marketing plan and risk management plan. Um, risk management plan is, is always something that is tough. Um, as for a lender, I find it tough to talk to somebody about a risk management plan um, because oftentimes you're, you're talking about things that, um, you know, what if scenarios. So, you know, what if we see a decline in income? What if acreage declines? You know, all of these things that have um, an impact potentially on a customer's ability to repay um, their debts. Those are always tough conversations to have, but they're, they're very important conversations to have. So one thing that you can do at home is when you prepare your your cost of productions or your projections on income and expenses, you can take and um, do like a sensitivity analysis. Say, what if we saw a decline by 10% in income or an increase by 10% in expenses? How would that affect my business? Those are all things that you can do prior to meeting with your lender um, to kind of know your own risk tolerance for your business and, and your plans for the future. Okay, the next thing is when you go meet with your lender, you're probably going in there for a reason. You have something you wanna purchase, you need an operating line of credit, um, you saw this piece of land, um, you talked to a real estate agent and found out the land was for sale for X amount. So you're inquiring about something. So when you meet with your lender, request reasonable loan amounts in terms. Be prepared to explain the purpose of the loan and the repayment terms or the repayment plan. So this is something that um, it, it's not necessarily a set in stone, um, you know, it's not a set in, set in stone situation, but generally speaking, your loan term should match the useful life of what you're financing. For instance, if you're financing a, a piece of equipment, whether that be new, new or used, you're probably not gonna want a 30 year term on that equipment. Something more along the lines of three to five years, depending on the age and the condition of the equipment is probably more reasonable, right? So if you have, you know, you're going to purchase a $25,000 tractor it's not reasonable to go in and meet with your lender and ask for a 30 year term on that. The, the lender is going to say, well, you know, the useful life of this, this tractor is probably, you know, three to five years. We need that loan term to really match the useful life of the equipment. With that being said, you know, explain the purpose and explain the repayment. Is the repayment primarily going to come from farm income? Um, if it's not, and maybe you farm on the side and work a W-2 job, well, maybe the true repayment for that tractor, if the farm doesn't really generate that much cash flow, is going to be that W-2 job. So be prepared to kind of talk about, A, the purpose, and B, how the loan is going to be re repaid when you're, when you're meeting with, with your lender. Um, Finally, ask questions. Yeah, this, this one is, this is good. Um, when, when folks come and I meet with folks, I really like when they ask questions. The more questions they ask, the more I can share with them different ideas or different things that I've seen. 
Um, you know, I don't like when somebody comes in to, to meet with us that if it's just a one-sided conversation, if I'm just, you know, rambling on about different, different things that I can and can't do, well, I want to make sure that those things align with their goals, right? So if they ask questions of me, ask different questions about learning the process of, you know, receiving whatever loan that they're inquiring about, it really helps me gauge um, kind of where they're at in the operation and where they want to go. So do we have any questions on meeting, um, you know, the, the initial meetings with a lender? All right, so we will move on um, to looking at some key financial measures. All right, so the Farm Financial Standards Council um, identified the, the following five critical areas for analyzing financial performance. First is solvency, the second is liquidity, the third is repayment capacity, fourth, efficiency and the fifth is profitability i'm going to touch on each of these aside from profitability um metrics those um are somewhat difficult to uh explain and i think that really those those aren't going to apply uh, apply to uh, the situation most folks are in So solvency. So solvency compares an owner's equity and creditor's percentage of ownership in the operation. This one's pretty simple um, to put together, but it's really just total assets minus total liabilities is going to give you your net worth. Um, and then if you take your total debts and divide those by your total assets, you're going to get your solvency or your debt to asset ratio. So in this example, we have um, total assets of 950,000 with total liabilities of 400,000, which gives us a net worth position of 550,000. So of those $950,000 that this example uses in assets, 400,000 of that is debt or total liabilities. So take the 400 divided by the 950,000 and you get a debt to asset ratio of 42%. So here you'll see green, yellow, red. So kind of stoplight type indicator of where those ratios need to uh, or need to be or where your goal for them should be. So a debt to asset ratio of less than 30% is in the green. That's, that's strong. Um, the yellow is 30 to 55% and then greater than 55% is red. So, um, you know, with a 42% in this example, you're, you're right there in the middle of the yellow. Um, but there's, you know, I'll kind of preface this with if one or, one or two of your ratios isn't in the green or isn't in the yellow, that's not necessarily bad if there's a justification for why it is what it is, right? For example, sometimes a debt to asset ratio may be a little bit higher for somebody that's starting out um, or um, has expanded their operations significantly. Um, and they did so very quickly, right? They had to borrow a lot of money to expand. Well, that's gonna drive up that debt to asset ratio. That doesn't necessarily mean that they pose a huge credit risk to a bank um, as long as that debt to asset ratio um, or any ratio for that matter, if there's a justification for why that ratio is what it is, right? So if the operation has not grown and everything's remained steady, say over the last five years, and then we start to see that debt to asset ratio creep up and get higher, well, there's not really any explanation for that. So, you know, that wouldn't necessarily be good, but if, you know, somebody doubled the size of their operation and had to buy all new equipment or, 
you know, buy more equipment, yeah, that, that may be a reason why that debt to asset ratio has started to increase and it's not necessarily um, a huge concern, right? If, if we can explain why that ratio has done what it's done. So the next thing is liquidity. So liquidity really measures the ability of the operation to meet financial obligations as they come due. So we got two different things here. We got our current ratio and we have working capital. So your current ratio is simply your current assets divided by your current liabilities. So in this example, current assets, which generally are cash, uh, cash equivalent equivalents, maybe um, grain that's waiting to be sold, CDs, things like that. Um, so for this example, we have 350,000 and our current liabilities are 300,000, which gives us a uh, current ratio of 116%. So another way to kind of dive into liquidity is look at your working capital. So simply what is the difference between your current assets and current liabilities? In this example, it's 50,000. So that's your cushion, right? Once all of our current liabilities are paid from our current assets, we have an additional $50,000. Um, the benchmarks here are anything over 150% is, is green. Um, yellow is 100 to 150. Um, red is obviously less than 100. Um, you know, that yellow range from 100% to 150%, that's a broad range. Um, you know, if, if you start getting less than say 110%, you know, there is not that much cushion um, left to absorb any, um, anything adverse that comes up. So really, the higher your current ratio and the more working capital you have, the better, right? And this is gonna change, especially for farmers, this liquidity position is gonna change throughout the year, right? Like right after the grain is sold, that liquidity position is probably gonna be looking pretty good. Um, but as you progress through the year with no new sources of income coming in, that liquidity position may, um, may change. Um, so it's definitely something you can monitor, um, but but the, the, bet, the higher the liquidity, the better. There, there's no such thing as too much liquidity, in, in my opinion. Um, so I just got a question, is there a, minute, is there a minimum credit score or is it case by case? So that's a really good question. So um, credit score is, if we kind of go back to the beginning of the, the PowerPoint, each creditor is going to use different, um, different, ratios and, and analysis to determine credit risk, right? So credit score is one of those. Um, not all banks and financial institutions actually report to the credit bureau. Um, so for instance, farm credit, our loans do not show up on a credit report. So, um, you know, with that being said, a, 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 credit, a credit score, um, having a good score is good, right? Um, and having a bad credit score is not necessarily, um, you know, it's not, it's not ideal. But sometimes a low credit score doesn't mean the customer is necessarily a huge financial risk or, or poses a financial risk to a bank, right? You know, let's say that you have an auto loan, a mortgage loan, and a credit card loan and your score is, I don't know, let's say 500. Well, if you just look at the score, yeah, that, that, that's not a good score. But if, let's say there's a $35 medical collection out there that you had no idea about, and that's what's bringing your score down, well, you know, that's, that's just something that got lost in the mail. You know, you, 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 we talked to you and you say, yeah, I had no idea I had a medical collection. You call it up you know, the creditor of whoever had that collection and pay it off, you know, there, there, there was no risk there. So that, that question is totally, it depends, right? Um, I wouldn't say there's necessarily a minimum credit score, but that is going to be lender specific um, and, and, and definitely be on a case by case scenario, but good question. 
Um, so I think we kind of worked through liquidity. Um, so we'll, we'll jump into uh, repayment capacity. So repayment capacity is really what measures the ability to repay term debt from farm and non-farm income. So this is really what a, a, a lender is gonna look at. What is your ability, you know, if, if, if we extend money, what is your ability to, to pay us? And how is that money coming in? Is it coming in from farm income, rental income, W-2 income, um, all, all different, there's all different sources of how income comes in um, but it's, but it's really just your ability to, uh, to repay term debts from, from income. So you can, a, a ratio we commonly look at is what we call your coverage ratio. So this is total income minus taxes, minus living expenses, uh, divided by your term debt, principal and interest payments. So for, in, here's an example, you have $120,000 in total income taxes are 15,000 and you project your living expenses at 30,000. Take that divided by 60,000, your coverage ratio is 125%. So again, the higher, the better, right? The, the more cushion we have there, um, the better. So green is gonna be greater than 150%, yellow 110 to, to 150, and then less than 110% is gonna be in the red. Uh, so this person at a 125 is right there in the yellow. Um, again, the, the higher, the better. So the more we, the more coverage we have, the better. Um, but this is one that depending, you know, this is going to change as well, right? Because this is really a derivative of your, your term debt. Um, so if you take on more term debt with all other things being equal, your, your income, your taxes, your living expenses are all remaining the same, and you take on more debt, like you went out and bought a new tractor or you bought a farm, you're going to see that coverage ratio decrease. So again, this is one that, depending on the way it's moving, isn't necessarily um, bad, but it needs to be justified on why it's doing what it's doing. If, if all things are staying the same, you haven't taken on new term debt, um, your, your coverage ratio shouldn't be de uh, decreasing. It, it, it should either be remaining the same or actually increasing. So um, that's one thing to keep in mind that yes, if your, your, your coverage ratio decreases some, um, but it's justified, it's not necessarily a horrible, horrible thing. Um, so efficiency, this is, this measures how, how efficiently a business uses its productive capabilities. So, uh, I really like this one. This is the, what we call the operating expense ratio. So you just take your total farm expenses and divide it by your gross farm income. So for example, you have $350,000 in expenses and a half million dollars in income that gives you a 70% operating, um, expense ratio. So really I think the simplest way to think about this ratio is for every dollar you make, it took you 70 cents to make that dollar, right? So 70, 70 cents of that dollar was used for the expenses in producing that dollar, right? So obviously the lower in this ratio, um, the better, right? So if it only took you 40 cents to produce a dollar, that's better than it taking you 90 cents to produce a dollar. Um, interest expense ratio. Um, this one is really just, you take your operating interest. So interest on really your lines of credit and short-term capital, and you add that to your term debt interest and divide it by your gross farm income. Again, this one, the lower, the better, right? What is your interest expense relative to your income that you're producing? Um, I would say out of these two ratios, I tend to look more at that operating expense ratio. Um, that one kind of tells me a little bit more, especially on smaller operations. You know, like I said, for them to produce $1, how much is it costing? And, you know, historically, um, you would like to see that either A, remain the same, or B, actually uh, decrease a little bit, right? Um, you know, as people get more and more experience, you, you really want 
you would think that that ratio actually would come down a little bit unless it's explained by something else. So fuel prices went through the roof. Well, hey, it may creep up one or 2% in that given year, but it was justified by, the, by fuel expenses or chemical expenses, fertilizer expenses, whatever it is. If it increases, hopefully there's a justification for why it increased. So this kind of jumps into what farm credit does. Um, so one of our main products available to uh, farmers is operating lines of credit. So really these are, the, the design of these is to utilize them for financing your cash flow needs throughout the growing season. Um, your principal balance is generally paid back on an annual basis. We set these up, uh, um, generally on a 12 month term. Um, the interest rate is variable. We don't use LIBOR anymore, so they're just indexed prime. Um, and we have the ability to what we call fast cash, but it's just an electronic transfer from um, into, your, into your checking account or savings account, whatever, whatever you have. So let's say a quick example is, um, let's say your projected farm expenses for the year kind of based on your crop schedule is going to be $100,000. So you would come in and meet with your lender at the beginning of the year. And let's say that, you know, you're primarily farming um, corn and soybeans and, and you project that you're going to need a $75,000 line of credit. So let's say we met in January to set up this $75,000 line of credit. So we approved the loan. That means farm credit, we're committed um, at any time during that year to give you up to $75,000. So, you know, let's say January, you don't really need any of that $75,000. Um, but then March, you have um, an expense that comes up and you need $15,000. So what we can actually do is we can just transfer $15,000 against your line of credit into your checking account and you use it to uh, basically pay for those cash flow needs. Um, we would have it structured where, you know, your maturity is the next January. So what that means is the idea is after you sell your crop, say November, December, um, maybe if you spill over into the first part of the next year, you sell your crop, you pay us whatever you used off your line of credit, whether that be 10,000 or 75,000, you pay us the principal back plus the interest, and then you keep what's left. Um, so it really helps bridge those short term cash flow needs throughout the year if you don't have income continuously um, coming in. Depending, I will say, depending on the industry, um, farm credit, for example, is, is flexible in scheduling the payment to meet the cash flow needs, right? So if you're a nursery operation and, you know, you have a, a whole bunch of sales in the spring and the fall, well, maybe that principal balance and that maturity is not in January. Maybe it's in the fall, right? If the fall is kind of your cleanup period and really the end of your year before you get into, um, you know, the following springs crops. Yeah, we can work with you on, you know, setting up that maturity of that line of credit to be really when, when it makes sense for, for your particular operation. So another thing we do is machinery and equipment loans. Generally, we can finance up to 85% of the purchase price. Uh, terms are up to five years. So these loans are a little different. They're not on a variable interest rate. They're on a fixed interest rate for the life of the loan. Um, and payments can be structured monthly, quarterly, semi-annual, or annual to, 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 to match your cash flow needs. For example, a full-time farmer is probably not going to want monthly payments on a piece of equipment, right? So we would set that up for maybe the end of the year or, the, or at the beginning of a year um, with just one annual payment. Um, that would probably make more sense for that operation versus having monthly payments when, you know, historically those summer months, there's not much cash coming in. It wouldn't make sense for them to be paying monthly, um, monthly payments there. So we're very flexible on structuring the loan to best meet your needs and also match it with when you have cash flow to be able to, to repay those loans. 
So land loans, um, this is probably the, the second biggest thing we do aside from the operating loans and that's uh, land loans. So we'll, first and foremost, we'll finance anything from one acre to 10,000 acres. Um, and I'm gonna stop there because I got a good question on, um, I believe this is in reference to operating lines of credit. Do you have to pay interest on unused funds? No, you only pay interest on what you've used. So if we set up a $75,000 line of credit and you use $10,000, you pay interest on $10,000. You do not pay it on 75. So yes, it is based on what you use and any unused funds, nope, you do not pay interest on those. Great question. Um, so land loans, like I said, no acreage minimums. We'll do a, a, a one acre all the way up to, you know, 10,000 acres if, if you can find that large of a piece. Uh, financing is generally going to be 80% of the lesser of the two, of the purchase price or the appraised value. So if the appraised value, if the, you know, let's say you found a piece of land that was listed for $100,000, we order an appraisal and the, it, well, it was listed for 100,000 and you enter a purchase contract and you agree to purchase it for 100,000 and the appraisal comes in at 120,000, we're still only gonna finance 80% of the 100,000. So you do have to bring 20% um, into the deal. Um, it also works the opposite. So let's say you agree to purchase it for 100,000 and it appraises for 80,000, we're only gonna be able to finance 80% of 80,000. In that situation, you would be, you know, you would be paying above market value. Um, so like I said, we can only, we would only be able to finance the 80% the of the 80,000 in that, in that example. Uh, land financing is, is, is good up to, uh, up to 20 years, and that's gonna be on a fixed rate um, for the life of the loan. So set it up to where you can make the same payment, just like a residential mortgage for the life of the loan. Uh, his farm credit as an agriculture lender um, or lending on agriculture properties, we have very low fees. Um, and then again, Payments can be structured on monthly, quarterly, semi-annual, or annual basis to meet your, your cash flow needs there. So um, like I said, for a, for a full-time farm operation, it's probably gonna make sense on land to either do semi-annual or, or annual payments. Um, and again, no acreage minimums or no acreage restrictions. Um, so the, kind of the final thing here is the FSA Guaranteed Loan Program. So what the, really what the FSA Guaranteed Loan Program is, is it provides lenders with a guarantee of up to 95% of the loss of principal and interest on a loan. And it permits lenders to make agriculture credit available to farmers who do not meet the lender's normal underwriting criteria. So this kind of circles back to the first few points that I made with, you know, every lender is out there to assess your ability to repay and also assess the risk. Well, if for some reason you, you know, your request or your financial position or, or whatever it is, is presents too much risk to the lender, the lender can actually go get an FSA guarantee, um, which basically guarantees the lender that the most they can stand to lose on the deal being 5%, 95% of that is guaranteed by the Farm Service Agency. So you got two different types of guaranteed loans. The guaranteed ownership loan um, is used to purchase farmland, uh, construct repairs and buildings, um, and then develop farmland to promote uh, soil and water conservation or to refinance debt. Um, then the second thing that, that a lender can get a guarantee with is an operating loan. So that's kind of what we talked about. Those are two finances, short-term cash flow needs, purchase livestock, farm equipment, uh, feed, seed, fuel, farm chemicals, insurance, or anything else that you need to actually operate. Um, 
it says operating loans can be used to pay for minor improvements to building to buildings you know a, a, a small improvement or um you know an equipment repair something like that that you know you don't want to have to term out for five years you can use you can use your operating loans to uh to cover that Uh, FSA also offers a down payment program. This is this is a special program to assist uh, beginning farmers to, to purchase a farm. Um, I will say with some of these FSA programs, it really comes down to eligibility. Um, and if you have specific questions about any of these FSA programs, I would reach out directly to FSA and ask them specifically or even set up a call with you know your local banker or your farm credit uh, relationship manager where you could set up maybe a joint phone call um, with both your lender and FSA to try and figure out um, A, if you qualify and B, what FSA may be able to help with. But I'll run through this down payment program. So this is really for beginning farmers that have not been in operation for more than 10 years. They currently do not own more than 30% of the average farm size uh, for the given city or county at the time of application. Um, and the maximum FSA loan amount does not exceed 45% of either the purchase price, the appraised value, or 667,000. I think that 667 is just a cap on how much they can lend the FSA loan term is for 20 years. Um, and then the remaining loan uh, or the, the remaining portion of the loan is obtained from farm credit. And then that loan amortization term is 30 years. So FSA is farm, the farm service agency. Um, they have a ton of programs for people that are just getting into farming. Um, I, I believe they have offices kind of scattered all throughout the state. Um, you can quickly Google them or go to usda.gov.com.gov uh, and look up your, your local office. But the FSA office, the extension offices, all of those things are going to be great folks to have, um, you know, as you guys you know, if you want to start a farm or looking to buy land and get into farming, those are going to be great tools and resources for you guys to reach out to and ask questions, find out about the programs, find out if there's any uh, special loan programs or grants or anything like that that are available to you. Uh, the, and the final thing is, is what, what is called a FSA joint financing arrangement. Um, so this is, again, this is, this is a very specific qualification, but it's a special lo loan program to assist beginning farmers. Um, the loan purchase can be for any authorized FSA uh, farm ownership purpose, which those were the items I talked about on a couple slides ago that were like purchase land, repair buildings, um, anything like that, anything that's really, um, affixed to the property um, would, would qualify under, under this, this program. Um, but this, this program is really what happens is FSA ends up lending 50% of the amount financed and another lender like Farm Credit would, would match the other 50%. So this type of arrangement um, is commonly seen when we have a beginning farmer that you know, maybe presents a little bit too much risk for say farm credit to finance um, whatever they're requesting. Let's just say it's a farm purchase. Um, they present a little bit much, too much risk based on our normal underwriting standards. Um, so what we may be able to do is actually work with FSA where FSA takes 50% of the risk and farm credit takes 50% of the risk. Um, and make that and make that come together for the customer. So generally speaking, um, FSA's loan term will not exceed 40 years of their useful life of the security. So if it's a land, you may be able to get a 40 year loan with them. Um, and then with farm credit, the 50% we financed would be um, done on a, um, a 20 year term, which is our normal course. 
um, course of financing. Um, let's see, I got a question here. What percentage of our loans also use FSA? Um, I, are, are, are you specifically kind of referencing like how many joint financing arrangements and things like that that we have? Is that, is that the question? Um, I would say it's not a large percentage of our loans. Um, do we do like, like the joint financing arrangement and programs like that, but it's more so, um, you know, sometimes FSA has FSA, what they call FSA direct loans, where that's a loan that is directly done through FSA. And normally that's the best place to start, right? If you're a beginning farmer, FSA is going to be, if, if, if you can get direct financing and are qualified and are eligible for financing from them, I would say nine out of 10 folks end up just starting directly with FSA. So the joint financing arrangements and the down payment assistance, sometimes those aren't as popular just because there's better rates and terms for beginning farmers through an FSA direct loan. So um, yeah, to ask, uh, to kind of go back to that question, um, I would say a large percentage of beginning farmers do use FSA financing in some way, shape or form. Let's see. So questions, um, I know I kind of ran through a lot uh, relatively quick. So if you guys have any questions, I will be happy um, to, to answer them. I'll do the best I can. Um, okay. Can you repeat that? You have like three questions in the chat box right now that we oh. haven't addressed with you. Okay, go ahead. Is there any way you can read them, read them to me? Yes, sir. Okay. So the first one, they said they contacted their local FSA office and they think at a beginning farmer, we need to show one to three years of production history to be eligible for an FSA loan. Is that what you guys have ran into? Hold on, real. <laughs> real quick i'm having some trouble hearing the question maybe i should read susan's having some trouble with her sound yeah i i can hear you a lot better okay all right the first one it says um i contacted my local fsa office in new kent and a beginning farmer would have to show one to three years of production history to 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 be eligible for an fsa loan i guess it's not a question okay so right so you know Again, and I'm not an expert on the FSA side um, by any means, but if, if they require one to three years of experience, um, my, and I'd have to look into this a little more, but maybe, you know, does what qualifies as experience, can it be experience, you know, working with someone else um, or does it have to be completely operating on your own? I don't know that answer, um, but you know, if 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 they reached out to the to the local New Kent office, then that that that's you know that sounds reasonable that for them to finance anything, they'd want you know one to three years of some sort of operating history. Um, you know, I think really the, the 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 toughest thing is getting that initial you know that first year of financing, right? So. And, and that kind of goes back to the beginning of the presentation. Um, you know, when you're, when you're starting from nothing and, and getting into that first year of financing, there is a lot of risk there um, for any lender. So the, the, that's where it's really going to come down to, you know, how much have you thought about your business plan um, and how prepared are you, right? Because if you're not prepared to talk about financials, what's gonna be the result when bills actually have to get paid? So the more preparation you can do, 
before even meeting with the lender, obviously the better. Um, in those first couple of years, maybe that's when, you know, we, we look at those joint financing arrangements, right? Where we, you know, we talk with FSA um, and kind of share the risk. Uh, in a situation like that, what I would recommend doing is talking with your lender, whether it be farm credit or anybody else, and ask if they can set up a joint conversation between, um, you know, like a conference call or, or an in-person meeting where it's joint between FSA, the lender, and the customer, right? The, the more questions that can get answered, the more ideas that can get shared. I'm sure there's, there's something that, you know, some, something can be, some arrangement can be made, right? Maybe, maybe we can't finance everything that you're requesting in the first year, but hopefully we can give you a plan to get from, you know, point A to point B. And it might, like I said, it might not be, you know, if you want to go out and buy five tractors, maybe we can't do that, but maybe we could start with one um, and, and slowly get to where we need to be so that you can accomplish uh, what you're looking to do on your farm. Okay, there was another question here. Uh, from Zatima, it says, how does my current home with acreage become qualified for operating loans as a beginning farmer? Can you repeat that one more time? How does my current home with acreage become qualified for operating loans as a beginning farmer? Um, so from, so from farm credit standpoint, I don't know exactly what FSA would consider, but if you have a home with acreage and you're, you know, as long, as long as you're putting it in, as long as it's in ag production, you know, that qualifies for an operating loan. Um, if, if your, if your home is, is where, if, if you live on the farm and, and the farm's being used for farming, yeah, you can, we can extend operating, uh, capital for whatever you're farming at, 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 at your home farm. Okay. And then she also asked, what does LIBOR stand for? So LIBOR was just an index for interest rates. Don't worry about it because it's not being used anymore. It's actually going away. Um, so what it used to be was um, a, an index for interest rates. Um, but we don't use it. Uh, I just didn't have, I didn't take it out the slide. So we just use prime, which you guys can look at. Um, you can just Google what's the prime rate. So if primes three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent it, it's readily available. Um, I think it, the Wall Street Journal is where, where I check it frequently, but it's just an index for deriving your interest rate. Okay. And there were some comments on Facebook. It said Schedule F is what they need for three years. I think that was commenting on the previous question. Okay. Unless, unless you're a veteran, then it's two years. And then another question, if it's, if it's joint finance, can you refinance at a later date? I would have to look into what the FSA requirement is on that. Um, I, I believe you can. Um, I know for farm credit, none of our loans have any prepayment penalty. So yes, they can be refinanced after, I don't know, six months, six years, it, it doesn't matter. I would have to double check on the, the, the joint financing arrangement. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I wouldn't think, I, I would think you could, but I'm not 100% positive on that. Okay. I apologize. I cannot answer a lot of the FSA questions. Um, that some of those are very specific to 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 FSA pro, FSA's programs. And um, the best advice I can give is just reaching out to an FSA uh, agent. Okay. Zatima also said, "Do you need a farm number?" Uh, no. Uh, so for farm credit, uh, I, I see that, that question now, do you, do you need a farm number on the property to be considered for USDA programs and funding? So that is U, USDA specific. I don't know what their specific regu, you know, regulation is when it comes to 
um, um, their, their financing and funding. Um, again, that's, that's an F that's an FSA question specific to, to FSA and USDA. <clears throat> Let's see if I missed any. Was there a question about Schedule F? Schedule F. Oh no. Okay, never mind. He was see just clarifying. I think when the, when she was talking about the three the three years the three years they want to see the the Schedule F. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, I will say, I don't know if you can hear me okay, Mr. Susan. Um, I have seen them use experience with like between Texas and the state or volunteering on a farm or community garden as experience time when they're looking for that one to three years at uh, USDA for their different program. Okay. Yeah. It's, I, you broke up for a second, but did you say basically volunteer in things like working on farms and, and all of that? kind of helped helped folks meet requirements? Right, they're looking for experience as well as a thing. So even if you're not selling, if you keep record of what's growing, even if it's a garden, that can be counted towards what USDA is looking for. Yeah, and absolutely. So that that's actually a really good point because from like the farm credit specific, specifically, um, if in, you know, I don't want to, like I said, I'm not an, an expert in USDA and FSA programs, but when you're coming to meet with a farm credit relationship manager or loan officer, the volunteering and, you know, having worked on a farm, you know, just because this is your first year farming on your own, if you've worked at a farm or maybe you're taking over somebody else's farm and you have that experience, that's awesome. That, that, that's going to, pay dividends for you and talk to your relationship manager about that experience, right? Um, you know, if you've been volunteering or even, you know, working a few hours a week at, if you, if you want to start a produce operation um, and say you just want to sell stuff on the weekends, well, if you have experience, you know, maybe working at a farmer's market or working for someone else, that's all great stuff that you can you can talk to your lender about so that the lender knows yet this person is qualified as far as, you know, growing and producing things and, 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 and they know their stuff. So that's, that's great. That's actually a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up because, um, you know, from, from farm credit standpoint, having the, the volunteering and working and work experience, whether it was paid or not is, is, is great. There was a comment here on Facebook. It says, oh, if I haven't made money on my farm, but want to ramp up my operation at a new site with a good business plan after I retire from the National Guard, is that unheard of? No, that's not unheard of. I, I think, so I guess to answer the question, no, that's not unheard of. Um, and if you're expanding the operation, um, you know, that in, that's something super specific. So I don't want to talk, you know, get kind of down, go down that path. But j the, the quick answer is no, that's not unheard of. And that's something that you would really want to meet with your, your, your lender and talk about, right? So let's talk about that expansion. Is, have we not made money in the past? because of something, right? If, if things are justified, it makes it, it's better than, than not being justified. So if you weren't making money because of poor soil types, or you had a lot of equipment that, you know, you didn't have enough land to really justify having all of that equipment, but with expanding, um, your operation, you're going to be able to use that equipment to its maximum potential, or you have better soil types there. The yields on that farm have historically been better than what you're currently farming. That was kind of preventing you from making money or even maybe losing money. Yeah, those are things that when you go talk to your lender, 
be prepared to talk about, right? If you can find yield history of that farm and, and what that farm has produced historically, that's going to help that lender kind of understand why you believe that you're going to be able to produce more income by expanding the operation. Okay, there's another comment here. It said, if expanding while being in the National Guard, the soldier should talk to his or her unit's readiness NCO at their respective armory about being able to apply for a personal hardship waiver in case there are future de deployments. Okay, that's just a comment. Okay. So I got a comment on records uh, for expenses and yields, even if you're not selling. Yes, please keep those records. That is very, very important. The more records you have, the better. So even if you're not selling at market and you're just starting to, to grow and produce things, keep records of your expenses and your yield history. That's gonna be very important to your lender, um, shows your experience um, and, I will say getting in the habit of keeping good records when someone is smaller is really, um, really helps as you, as you get, as you grow your operation, right? So if you don't keep good records when you're small, how are you gonna keep good records when you are growing your operation? And records are everything from uh, accounting to, um, to financing, everything. You gotta have good records. Keeping good records is the key to success. Um, because then really what, what you can do with your records too is if you had a poor year, say in 2017, if you don't have good records, you're not gonna know why you had a poor year, right? So if you had good records and we could see that, hey, look, oh my goodness, the seed and chemical expenses were through the roof in 17 and it didn't produce any more income, um, you know, you wouldn't know that without, without good, good records. So keep good records. Um, even if you're not selling anything, keep that yield history and keep those expenses on what you've been spending and, um, you know, do your own analysis, right? If you're, if you don't really need financing or anything like that, and you're just trying to see how your operation did, um, you know, by keeping records, you'll be able to kind of dive into your own operation and, and see, you know, where you can possibly save money um, or even where the majority of your expenses are going and, 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 and try and, um, you know, keep that in mind in future years. So we have, are there any other questions? Did we, did we get to all of them? I don't see any on here. Maybe give them one more chance. Okay. Any more questions? I'm not seeing any more questions either. Do you want to give them another minute or two or? So I think we've taken care of everybody's questions. And we just wanted to say thank you for sharing your information with us today. No problem. Thank and you guys do you have me. your contact information somewhere that they can see, or can you put it in the chat? Yes, I will. Um, let me see if I can go to the chat. Yeah. So I will put my email and phone number in the following message if you guys have any questions. I work out of our Chesapeake office. Um, so if you're down in Chesapeake or Virginia Beach, 
um, those are the, the, the loans that, um, that's the, the, the area I normally, um, I normally cover, but we have offices all over. Um, so let me see here. So that's my email and my phone number is coming next. If you guys have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I'd be happy to, to answer um, any questions that you guys have, especially, you know, if, if you have something specific, just reach out, reach out to your extension office, reach out to FSA, reach out to farm credit, everybody, um, whether you're in lending, accounting, um, you're an attorney, you know, everybody wants to see you succeed with your farm operation. So reach out. If you don't know the, um, the answer to, to the question, just ask. I, I am happy to help anybody um, that wants, that is getting into agriculture or has any questions, reach out. Well, thank you again for coming on with us today, Andrew. Absolutely. And I guess we'll send you any questions that come up later and we, we'll make sure this is all live so people can see it on YouTube later, later also. All right. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.